Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 103. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And welcome to 2018. Yeah, it's our first app of 2018. Happy New Year. Totally. Did oh. you have a good one? Really good. Can you tell by my horse throat that it was good? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was um, doing sound engineering at a rave, so we had like <laughs> massive DJs from Ibiza. Oh, wow. Well, I went back to the parents a couple of days there, uh, played quite a few video games, which is good. Got a lot of new stuff for Nintendo Switch I've been playing on. Uh, New Year's Eve, we actually went to a ball. Oh, nice. Very fancy. Well, it's been Um, good to have this time off, hasn't it? Because you've been able to play games, you've been able to just kind of actually have some time not working, which uh, (laughs) is a real rarity for us. But it is nice to uh, not only be back for 2018, but also um, our second birthday as well. Oh, yeah. All going off this week, so here we go. The Retro Hour podcast celebrates two years, and obviously in that time, I mean, let's just say a huge thank you to the people who allow us to keep coming in and doing this show week in, week out, because I did notice actually over Christmas, a lot of emails came through. This is due for renewal. Hosting's due for renewal. Yep. SoundCloud's due for renewal. So if you did make a donation into the running of the show over the Christmas period, we really appreciate that, guys. And that's going to help us keep going throughout 2018. So if you'd like to find your place in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame, all you've got to do is make a donation. We accept their PayPal um, and all cryptocurrencies now. Well, well yeah, because... Um there's lots of tokens you can get under Ethereum, and yeah. we're kind of just accepting all of them. So we can do that uh, Ripple and all of these other <laughs> other ones as well. So, so. if you've got a bit of crypto lying around, and uh, you know, obviously everything we get will go back into the running of the show and help us keep doing it all throughout 2018. So thank you so much for making the Hall of Fame the first one of 2018. Andreas Sauer. Hendrik Peterson. Simon Wolf. And Peter Elsie. Thank you so much for your donations. If you'd like to join them in the Hall of Fame on a future episode, all you've got to do is nip onto our website, theretrohour.com. Now, we're going to get our first guest on of 2018 soon. Oh, and what a guest. We, we tried to get this guy on before, like, in 2017, and oh, it was a bit of a nightmare, wasn't it, to be <laughs> we, honest? Yeah. Yeah, we, Timing problems. I, you th- know, I yeah. think we've recorded this show twice now. <laughs> so. But it's, it was worth the wait. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, it's actually our first guest we've had in, like, what, almost a month, really, since then, Nolan Bushnell. So yeah. he, he follows, uh, you know, good company, doesn't he, this definitely. guy? Modern vintage gamer, Dimitri. Now... His YouTube channel is actually, it's very varied. I mean, he did start doing mostly Amiga stuff when he originally started, but he also does stuff like, um, I saw his recent video about the PSX. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's really going into stuff. And the thing I love about Dimitri is he's, he's a game developer as well. Yeah. So he actually ports stuff, and he'll show you the process of porting it whilst live streaming it, which is pretty cool. And he's from Australia as well, originally, yeah. which, uh, you know, the Amiga scene in Australia, we don't really hear much about that, or the general computing scene so it's gonna be really fascinating and just stuff like the the amiga vampire doesn't he ports games over to that yeah which yeah. is pretty cool so our very special guest this week modern vintage gamer um because we love having people like that we watch on youtube on the show as well because it's always a good conversation it is it is and i i was waiting for this interview i was like oh he's brought a video out we can talk about that <laughs> <laughs> <There's a new laughs> he's brought another one out yeah. another one yeah i mean he has been churning out some really good videos recently so he's gonna be our special guest dimitri is coming up on the retro hour podcast in around 20 minutes from now obviously we're into a new year you excited about 2018 then you thought yeah. about it much any new year's resolutions oh new year's resolutions no because i never stick to them <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're pointless they last for half a week i can't remember the one i said last year but i inevitably didn't stick to it so i'm yeah. the same i haven't made any i think my plan for this year is to get uh, my amiga 4000 working mm-hmm. with a video toaster flyer which is a kind of <clears throat> MPEG-1 video editing system. (laughs) High-tech? Yeah, really old school. So uh, I'm getting all my stuff recapped and kind of fixed up and repaired. So you can do like a little kind of old-school video kind of studio then? Yeah, yeah. Basically... um a non-linear video editing suite from the 90s. No one will have one of those, will they? It'll be like a museum piece. Well, funnily enough, I was watching some of Tech Moan's videos, who, again, is one of you know our mutual favourite YouTubers. Um, we've asked him to come on before. He doesn't really like to do interviews now, which is fine, you know, absolutely. Really good channel, though. Oh, amazing and, channel. Well, you know, yeah. just stuff like reel-to-reel recorders. And I was watching, like, one of his, like, videos about laser discs or something the other day. And I got thinking about, like, um, video equipment I use at school. And I used to bring my Amiga 500 in that we'd use for video titling. Mm -hmm. Um, But we had like some really high-end Panasonic and Philips video recorders that you could do overdubs with. And they'd have jog wheels and all that. Do you remember jog wheels? That's the way that they used to do it. So when they were video editing, they'd just have the two VHSs and then they'd have another one recording it. And they'd cut live between it. Now, the difference with the system I'm getting is I'm going to have a 
a thing that stores MPEG-1 video on a SCSI drive in there that right. I can <laughs> chuck in there. First kind of digital editor then, I guess. Yeah, okay, yeah. very cool. But I was looking at these old school video recorders and I just thought jog wheels. I remember jog wheels on yeah, video. Yeah, yeah, like... and they used to have SVHS. Do you remember Super VHS, yeah. which is like <laughs> a bit better? Yeah, I mean, 2018, I mean, if all goes to plan this year, I mean, we're planning on moving house in the summer, so I should have a bigger space for all my stuff. Yeah, because at the moment, if you go into Dan's room, <laughs> it's like uh, there's limited space because the wall are just towers of computers <laughs> all stacked up. I look back on my old YouTube videos of like when I first moved into that place about eight years ago and it looks so empty. And yeah, it's like, yeah, you know, oh, it's yeah, expanding. It. You could probably do a time lapse of your videos, <laughs> right? Just things growing up the yeah. walls, yeah. But Samantha, like, you know, to be fair to the wife, I try and keep everything in that room. So yeah, it's, she's uh, just as bad with the sewing. So oh, yeah, it's exactly, not that exactly. Bad. We're both as bad as each other. Yeah. But you know, hopefully, going to get like a, a, a nice big house in the summer. So um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously the most important things are internet speed before like anything yeah, else yeah yeah that's it seriously when I bought my new house I was like have they got fibre yeah <laughs> I've got it. yeah someone's yeah. been looking at like you know local crime rates and the council rates and all that I'm like <laughs> internet <laughs> yeah that's it so yeah 2018 should be a good one then obviously live events coming up as well we've got oh, loads of them, of them planned yeah lots of stuff coming out as well hardware you've got the Spectrum Next coming yeah. out you're going to have the Amiga Vampire standalone you know the Atari the, box. The C64 Mini, all of this. Yeah, yeah, so what a year it's going to be. And actually, you know, if you guys are making plans for 2018 as well, it'd be nice to find out maybe your New Year's resolutions, anything you're looking forward to coming up as any, well. Any projects you're aiming on kind of doing and... Uh... We'll see if they get completed. <laughs> Absolutely. It's always nice to cover them as well. So yeah. if you're working on stuff, do let us know about it. You can email show at theretrohour.com. We're all over social media as well, at Retro Hour UK on Facebook and Twitter. Right then, so before we get to this week's guest, there is a few stories. I mean, obviously it's been a little bit quiet because it's been Christmas and everyone's been on holiday. Yeah, it's just been Christmas lemmings and stuff like that. Well, let's talk about the Atari box because this is um, something that we've covered pretty much from day one, isn't it? Yeah, well, the Atari box is this new kind of console, which is the updated 2600 that's also going to be able to play modern games and all of this. Now, they've been doing pre-orders, and uh, they were expected to start today, but um, they've cancelled the pre-orders. Right, okay. And they've said this is because of a key element on our checklist is taking more time to create the platform and the ecosystem uh, that the Atari community deserves. So it seems like they were going to release it, and then somebody maybe said in the company, hey, wait a minute, this is not good enough. Let's delay the pre-orders. See, it's always interesting getting this you know, kind of project where you're taking essentially like a long kind of dead brand and yep. bringing it back for like a new audience. And I mean, again, we, we had Nolan Bushnell on our show about a month ago, the founder of Atari. Yeah. And he was saying he's actually... He's been in. I mean, he didn't give too much away, but he did say he's actually been going in and kind of consulting with these guys. So, I mean, there is some kind of, obviously, expertise involved in this project. Obviously, you know, disclaimer out there, it's not the original Atari company. No, they they no. went bankrupt in, like, the 90s. Yeah. Um, but I think it's in... The, in, na- in the brand, name's been passed on through a lot of people. Like all think, of these yeah. as well. So apparently they're not, um, you know, releasing any more details to the press, and I've have tried to get, like, a quote out of them as well. But the thing is, I mean... It's not unheard of for these kind of delays to happen, especially no, in no. Like these kind of projects. And, and they've announced a kind of uh, expected prices, which yeah. is between two forty nine and two ninety nine dollars. Which ain't bad, actually. Not bad if it's a new system, you know. I mean, again, I've not seen a lot of details about exactly what it can do. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I've heard it can play modern stuff and old school. That's yeah. about it. <laughs> is it going to have Steam on it? Is it going to be like an Android-based kind of thing? It's still... I've not really seen the answers to these questions like from like source. I've seen varying kind of people speculating what it's going to be on yeah. Reddit and 4chan and that kind of thing. But, I mean, it looks a cool system, though, I think. Oh, no, no. The design just looks beautiful. I love the wood grain and all of that. Yeah, and it, it is, you know, a big kind of throwback to the original 2600. Yeah. And for that kind of price, I mean, if it's going to be like 200 quid over here, that's kind of into, you know, almost into impulse buy kind of territory, isn't yeah. it? So yeah. I'd probably get one. I, I buy everything. That's why I need to big house. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of stuff I've got, actually, I've got vinyl as well now. My, my folks moved house last year, so I've got all my... I used to be a house music DJ. I used to play UK Garage as well. So I've got loads of vinyl, Technics 1210 turntables. There is just something about vinyl. I nearly got rid of it all, and I thought, I've put it into storage for now. When I get my nice big new place, I'm going to get my deck set up again. Yeah, yeah. All the vinyl on the wall. I mean, you used some DJ as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got loads of vinyl still, and it's, it's lovely. And actually, we've been covering this kind of rise of vinyl and yeah. how it's so big now. And what's happened is it's really interesting. They cut shut down all the vinyl plants in the UK, you see. So there was only a few surviving ones. Yeah. Now vinyls become incredibly popular. And that was started by the independents and the independent labels. So kind of people, 
you know, small bands releasing their releases on it. Now, what's happened, it's got so popular that the big companies have come in, the major labels, EMI and all of these guys, but what they're doing is they're creating dad rock. <laughs> now, <laughs> now they're basically doing stuff like they say, here we have uh, 20,000 copies of Dire Straits LPs that we need to press, and the plant drops production for all the smaller labels with these big orders. So basically... All these people trying to get new, cool indie music is getting pushed out by dad rock. <laughs> this is like net neutrality for vinyl, though, isn't it? Yeah, the opposite yeah. of net neutrality, yeah. It's, but, I mean, it is pretty cool to see that vinyl apparently is on a 25-year sales high at the moment. They haven't sold this many since the early 90s. It's insane, you know. They might start creating new vinyl factories in yeah. the UK. And cassettes as well are kicking off at the moment. I... I noticed people were selling cassettes with buttons and everything. Oh, we, we talked about that on the show the other day, that they're actually opening a new factory to produce, you know, cassette tape because the world's running out of magnetic tape. Yeah, well, they're saying vinyl's rising and CD sales are falling. I even like, you know, we've talked about the fact that local supermarkets, like, you know, your local Tesco's and your Sainsbury's and stuff, I've noticed that even Asda recently have started doing vinyl as well. Yeah, like, yeah. my local Asda, what used to be, <laughs> it actually used to be a Nintendo section. They've moved that into a smaller area and now it's all vinyl. Wow. So the yeah. Switch has been sidelined by, like, Oasis and Ed Sheeran records. And, so. that's the, and that's the thing as well. It's not just the latest releases. It's all the old stuff. Yeah. All the old stuff. All the classic albums. Kylie Minogue, Simply Red, Michael Jackson. So they're all getting reprinted. And that's what's causing all this chaos. Well, apparently the biggest selling vinyl album, um, you know, that Sainsbury's have had was apparently Fleetwood Mac's Rumours. <laughs> they're best selling <laughs> album today. 12,000 copies sold. But it is, you know, it's Led Zeppelin, oh, Pink God, Floyd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically old guys who are rebuying their record. Alan like, Partridge, <laughs> isn't it? That's what it is. <laughs> well, it's your people rebuying the youth, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same as our show, like we do with video games. It's like our dad's buying their record collection again, isn't it? So. Yeah, it, I just find it amazing that as yeah. soon as the big guys step up, you know, the indies are pushed out and they might have to start expanding. Because I remember, I, I really got into buying vinyl in the late 90s and early 2000s. Yeah. When I was DJing all the time, you know, it's kind of before, you could do like digital DJing then, but it was expensive. Yeah, yeah. And I had Technics turntables. But really after about like 2003, for when I, you know, eventually got like, a computer that was capable of playing MP3s and I got an iPod and all that kind of stuff. Didn't really bother with vinyl much after that. Um, so I haven't really bought any new vinyls for about 15 that years. That was it. I used, to, I used to get a lot of money and then I used to spend it on white labels yeah. and have all the dance vinyl. But, you know, that would be like seven or eight quid of vinyl. At least. Yeah, yeah. and then you'd get 20. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. You're just screwed for the rest of the time. But when it got to the stage where, you know, I got some CDJs at one point and then my mate would buy vinyl and we'd, I'd rip them off him and just yeah, yeah. burn them onto CD-ROMs and stuff. And then it kind of went away. But it, it it's now, you know, amazingly, everyone kind of wrote vinyl off and yeah, thought that it was, totally. you know, like you said, a lot of these pressing I plans I knew people down. who sold beautiful collections they had massive collections and then all got cds yeah i bet they're crying now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just you gotta wait another like 10 20 years till cds are cool again i guess yeah you? yeah so, keep vinyl alive i like it this is quite an interesting uh challenge to do maybe you did something similar if you had spare time over christmas you probably need more than a couple of weeks to do this though apparently someone has counted almost every coin in every mario game yeah, so th this is quite interesting. I think it's a bit of promotion for this uh, phone company um, called GifGaff, and yep. they're basically a small company that runs on the O2 network, and they only have a limited amount of staff, and if you want help, you basically have customers answering it. So they've done this kind of a... Uh, 60 hours of work <laughs> looking right. through all these Mario games. Obviously a busy company then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to count every single coin and kind of see how rich Mario is in the end. And apparently they've done a spreadsheet to break down and prove that they've done this. And they've actually, actually got a division that's to do with loans and savings. You know, that's why... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. It's kind of a nice little tie-in promotion thing. They've kind of stopped counting just before Mario Odyssey then. Yeah. So the total is, is how many coins Mario's collected. Obviously, they've done all the Mario games from Super Mario Bros., the original one, up to uh, Mario 3D World. And, uh, you know, the games on the Wii U and everything as well. So he's got... You ready to find out? This, yeah. is, this is why Mario's retired from being a plumber recently. Yeah, yeah, he's just given up. He's got all his coins. He's, he's done. He's got over 10 million coins. 10 million, my God. If, if those are Bitcoins as well, Mario, then you're doing well. <laughs> I can see it now, the Mario coin. Yeah, yeah. The next no, big thing Nintendo's <laughs> new crypto, yeah. So, yeah, a valiant effort. Not exactly sure why, but it, it's got in the headlines. We're yeah, talking yeah, about that's it. it. It's a good little piece of promotion. And this just shows that companies are really getting into retro gaming and they're really just getting into gaming as a whole as a kind of means of getting their message out, you know. 
And again, it's like, you know, <laughs> probably had a bit of time to do, uh, you know, sit around the office over Christmas numbers yeah, going yeah. on. So what can we do? There you go. Let's yeah, Bill, you just go and coin, <laughs> count every coin in that game. So if you want to see the little graphic, it's uh, actually a pretty little good chart that, you know, Kotaku have done. I'll put that in this week's show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, obviously, Zap was a legendary Commodore 64 magazine back in the day. Oh, yes. We've had a Gary Penn on who yeah. was actually part of Zap and, you know... It's just such a massive magazine, wasn't it? Even guys like, you know, um, Jazz Rignall, obviously. Yeah. The famous, most famous mullet in video games, I think, <laughs> didn't they? Um, but Zap had a bit of a comeback, didn't it? Yeah, totally. Like, there's been a lot of people talking about it recently. And um, Chris Wilkins is a guy, uh, Retrofusion Books, that creates these really fantastic kind of albums. And he's just done the Crash album this year in 2018. So, he's just announced, dun, 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 Zap 64 Annual 2019 <laughs> is going to come out. So, But often the way annuals work is to kind of work a year ahead, don't they? So imagine that's going to come out end of this year then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At some point in, in 20, 2018. I think it's cool that he gets the rights to all these old brands and can bring them back. And obviously, you know, the original people are involved in this as well. Oh, yeah, you know, he's going to get Jazz Rignall involved. Yeah, Gary Penn uh, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, having a resurgence of, like, magazines again so many years after they shut down... Because, I mean, people often forget just how big mags were back in the day. Oh, they, and how powerful they were. Yeah. They could destroy a company. They could, they could make and break a product. You know, it's really, really, people were in the kind of hands of the magazines back then. Well, I know in this year, I mean, you, you think of the last 12 months, Superplay obviously got a special one off free issue, didn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. Retro Gamer magazine. Amiga was, Joker as well. I was yeah. going to say Amiga Joker did as well. Now we've obviously had Crash and Zap back again as well. Yeah, yeah. So cause I remember, you know, sad times when your favourite magazine shut down. Well, it's, it's very much like the podcasters and the YouTubers are now doing the job of what the magazines yeah. did. But there's still that demand for the magazines. And it's just holding that and having that kind of, I, I hope it's a hardback Annual, you know, like your yeah. Bino one or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, it's quite interesting you made that point that we're kind of doing that job now. Only not, not driving Ferraris, unfortunately. Like no, that. no, no, no. <laughs> That's it. But, I mean, there are other mags I'd love to see back. I mean, you know, we mentioned the Amiga there, Amiga format. I'd love to see that back mm. for like a one-off. Yeah. These kind of mags that, you know, when they're shut down, you kind of think, oh, it's gone forever now. And yeah. it's sad. It would be good to see them coming back again. But... Oh, definitely. Especially getting annuals. You remember getting annuals as a kid? Oh, yeah, yeah. Exciting, the, wasn't it? the Bino annual. The best thing about annuals was, you know, they, they kind of... you. You could read them every year, yeah. like even though they That's were the two years annual. away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but they were like two years in the past, and you'd be like, "Oh, look at that!" <laughs> yeah. I remember getting the real Ghostbusters comic annuals. I get those every year for Christmas. They were Rupert the good. Bear. Yeah. <laughs> you, you weren't as cool as me, <laughs> Ravi. So, if you want to keep up to date with the progress of this, I'll pop it in this week's show notes. Uh, Chris Wilkins, the guy behind it. You know, Chris's books are always amazing, anyway, aren't they? So, amazing. Yeah, his Ocean one, one recommended. Now, before we get into this week's special guest, modern vintage gamer, we did mention the Amiga in passing there, but um, it's actually something quite. Cool, it's just come out for the CD32. Yeah, there's a Terrible Fire. Now, Terrible Fire, it's Stephen Leary. Yeah. He's a really cool guy because he makes hardware for the Amiga, but he makes open source hardware. And the thing is, Amiga, everybody's been private and holding their stuff and never <laughs> releasing it open source. So this is great food for the community. Or making things that don't really exist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right on the Vapor, Facebook. Right? yes. Um, but Stephen's stuff does. Yeah, Stephen's stuff does. And... These these adapters uh, for the CD32. Now the CD32 used to have expansions before, but they were terribly expensive. Now, let's just, you know, for people who might not be that into the Amiga, the CD32 was a console. A console yeah. that they released. It was basically an Amiga with a CD drive. Yeah, no keyboard, no ma no mouse, None no that, ports no. on the back. Didn't have the disk drive port. Didn't have a hard disk interface. Didn't Had have... S video out and composite. That's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I do remember in the nineties the worst of like the the SX1, the SX32. These were these add-ons that would go in the back. You could get like a CPU upgrade, put a hard disk in. Yeah, you could break reports. it out into a full Amiga. You could have a, a floppy drive in there. You could have but, everything, couldn't but you? But they, even when they were like new, were about 400 quid. Oh, totally. And to get yeah. them on eBay now, they're about 1,500 quid. Massive. And, you know, they had special features like the RGB out, yeah, which is really vital, actually, if you're playing some quite old school games to get the best image on the screen. And this little device does it all. It has... 8 meg of RAM, which yep. really helps with the Amiga. <laughs> you know, running those kind of first-person shooter games that came out, it just helps so much. Uh, PC PS2 adapter. Now, the keyboards for the Amiga CD32, there was one ever made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not going to find those on no, that. No, you know, the, the uh, so they use the CD TV ones, which are getting rarer and rarer. So using a PS2 keyboard is absolutely 
absolutely amazing. And an IDE interface, so you can have a hard drive. A oh, combat flashcard in yeah, there, yeah. worldly games. Because, I mean, the CD32 is, I've got two of them. And, you know, if I'm going to have an Amiga in the living room, it's a good system to have because it's small, it's compact, it's got your CD drive built in, you can do a load of games on. Yeah. But to have WHD load and a bit more memory, because you often find, I mean, if if you're not familiar with what WHD load is, it's a way that you can get. So a lot of Amiga games were made just for floppy disks, yeah. And you couldn't install them on a hard disk. I always remember being jealous of PC owners that could install all the games and not have to swap all the bloody disks around all the time. But there is a thing on WHD load, this system to load them onto a hard disk. If it hasn't got enough memory, the screen flashes black off and on, yeah, off and on, yeah. off and on. Oh, God, with a bit horrible. more RAM, you don't need that. It's not going to happen. Well, but. I was thinking, you know, th- these are eighty-eight. US dollars yeah. plus postage, which is really cheap. And this this guy's basically making up these boards yeah. and then send, selling them on um, Facebook. Yeah, and Kip, Kipper2K's been doing some yeah, as well with Alan them. H. Marks yeah. is the guy on the Commodore Amiga group. Very nice group, ran by Neil Green and those guys. And I was just thinking, they, they had that Laserdisc support, didn't they, at one point? So imagine if you could have Mad Dog McCree, a CD32, <laughs> and some kind of <laughs> adapter with this interface... You might be able to do the old You're school. already planning it, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got your virtual reality room now. You're going to have like a Mad Dog McCree room in your oh, house. Yeah. Next well, my around. friend's got a CRT projector as well, oh, which wow. is uh, RGB, the three different colours. That's what they worked on, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. But I always love to see new hardware for kind of neglected systems. Like, you know, I've been one of the things I've been looking most forward to is the EverDrive for the Jaguar, Yeah. which yeah. will eventually get made or, you know, some similar clone. And I think the CD32, if you, I'd, I'd always say to someone, if you wanted an Amiga just to play games on, that's going to be reliable, small, easy enough that you haven't got to mess around, CD32 is a very good option. And Definitely. this expands it a bit more. So. Yeah, it expands it more, but also people are making these great compilations at yeah. the moment with CD32 games. So, you know, we may get more games that come on this that previously couldn't have been handled without 8 megabytes, you know. And uh, Stephen's actually sent me one in the post as well, so oh, uh, wicked. look out for a YouTube video on that coming yeah. up soon. Thank you very much, Stephen. Right then, well, thank you for checking out our first episode of 2018, Woo-hoo. episode number 103. There we go. Back into our stride. Like, like we never took any time off. Totally. Many <laughs> more to come. And we've got some absolutely insane guests. We're going to try and get some guests on this podcast that have never, ever been on any other podcast before. Never spoken about those days. You haven't rested over Christmas at all, no, have you? I no. can tell. And, of course, lots of live events as well. Um, do check our calendar on our website, theretrohour.com. We'll talk more about those next week as they get nearer. Right then, let's get into our first guest of 2018. The amazing modern vintage gamer is our first guest of the year. And we'll see you next week. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and let's welcome on our first guest of 2018. And uh, this chap is behind one of our favourite YouTube channels. You may have seen him, Modern Vintage Gamer. Welcome to the show, and Happy New Year, Dimitri. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you for having me on the show. And I want to say that I'm a huge fan of the show. I listen to just about every single episode, so oh. ask me anything. Well, li- <laughs> likewise with your YouTube channel as well. I mean, for people that may not have seen your channel, you know, the, the uninitiated, uh, give us a lowdown then. What, what's your channel about? Absolutely, yeah. My channel, Modern Vintage Gamer, is uh, really a 8 and 16-bit uh, and sometimes 32-bit uh, retro computer and console tech channel um, where I do a lot of uh, stuff around tearing down the systems and really showing you inside what, what the internals look like. But there's also a slant on, on the game side as well. You know, um, it's, it's all really all about the games. And, and I, I do want to, you know, talk about the games for the system that I'm reviewing. So it's really just a, uh, a more technical, I guess, um, you know, channel where uh, I like to really dive into things and, and show you what things look like. Well, let's go back all the way to the kind of beginning and let's talk about your first gaming experience. My first gaming experience was probably when I was about eight years old. Um, I remember uh, coming home from school, uh, elementary school back in those days, obviously, and my my brother uh, and my dad had walked in uh, from uh, shopping and my brother had this big, long rectangular box and it had the words Commodore Vic-20 written on it. And uh, I was fascinated. It looked like a, a typewriter. And that was really my first, uh, well, that was my first home computer, the, Vic, the Commodore Vic-20. And, you know, it wasn't too much longer before we got sort of bored of typing in the the basic game listings in the in the manual, and uh, we knew a couple of kids at school that had games, and um, really, you know, the, the first uh, that was really my first you know experience with a computer was was the Vic Twenty, probably around I'd say eighty two or eighty three. 
Because you live in America now, but you're from Australia originally. That's correct. Yeah, I uh, was born in in Melbourne, Australia, and um, I moved to the US about 11 years ago. So I live in the mid Midwest of, of the USA these days. What was the scene like in in Australia when you were a kid? I mean, I know Commodore was actually quite a big brand out there, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I, I would say that in Australia, um, it was very aligned with what was going on in Europe and the UK. So obviously Commodore was was kind of front and center, the big player. And you could walk into any department store and and, and buy a VIC-20 or a C64 or, or even a Commodore 16 and a Commodore Plus 4 as well. There were certainly machines that were available on the shelves as well as any software you really wanted to get. I remember there was a lot of uh, Kmart stores around and they, they sold C64 games and VIC-20 cartridges and, and C16 games. Um, there was a lot of that stuff. But, you know, also there was a, a fairly big Amstrad uh, following as well. A lot of the stores would um, stock Amstrad computers. And even Sinclair had a fairly large user base in Australia as well. So, yeah, definitely a um, alignment with what was going on in, in Britain and uh, in Europe at the time. Yeah, I was going to say that does sound pretty similar to like my kind of school experiences as well. I mean, what were the kind of the consoles like out there? Was like the Nintendo and like Mega Drive and in Mars system, were they kind of big in, in, in like the late 80s? Yeah, they were. I mean, I think after Commodore kind of folded, you know, in the early 90s, um, people really started looking at, at other alternatives. And now Nintendo is, has always been a big player in Australia. Um, they, they have uh, a local you know, headquarters down there, or they used to have a local headquarters down there. I don't believe they do anymore. But um, the NES was certainly a popular machine, um, I think, well, all, worldwide. But um, the Sega Genesis and, and, the, and the Master System took a little bit longer to get um, you know, popularity. But uh, w- once the computers or, you know, the Amiga or the Commodore uh, had folded and the Amiga was no longer a, really a household name. Um, the consoles really took over that void. And I remember uh, in the mid nineties, you know, especially, uh, the Super Nintendo and, um, the, uh, Sega Genesis really just taking a stranglehold on, on the whole market. Well, uh, which software and games kind of stuck in your memory as a child? Yeah. I mean, good, good question. I mean, if we're going back to the C64, uh, I would say, um, you know, The Last Ninja is definitely one of my favorite games ever. Um, Sensible Software did uh, Whizball and Parallax. Those games I, I played to death. And, you know, I, I also like some of the, the stuff from, from the US, like Raid Over Moscow and Leaderboard and stuff like that. But if we're talking about, um, you know, 16-bit stuff, uh, the Amiga, uh, Pinball Dreams, Speedball 2. Um, again, a lot of the, you know, the, the stuff from the UK was was exceptional. Um, and console stuff, I mean, Super Nintendo uh, really was was a machine that I uh, grew up with uh, when I was kind of in my late teens, early 20s. And things like Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, some of those versus fighting games that really weren't particularly great on the computers. Uh, once I got stuck into those on the consoles, I was just in heaven with those games. I know today you do, um, you know, you do videos about coding. When did you first get into programming then? I think it really goes back to when I got the VIC-20. Um, I was very interested in in the manual. And the VIC-20 manual, for those people that don't know, is probably one of the best manuals with that you can get with a computer. It, it really explains everything about the machine in a layman's terms. And it really has a good guide about how to write and how to learn and write basic. And essentially the VIC-20 was the machine that I started programming on. And I remember by the time uh, we got an Amiga, you know, fairly, you know, a couple of years later, I guess five or six years later, I was really interested in in programming and and I wanted to do that. And that's what I ended up kind of doing um, when I went to college and, and, and things like that. What systems were you using at school then? Because over here in Britain, the, the Acorn BBC Micro and the Archimedes were like our main systems. I mean, what, what were you using when you were at school? Yeah, in high school, we had Apple IIs. And when I started college, we had moved on to uh, 286 PCs. Um, and we did uh, some stuff on, on Macintosh as well. But the PC was really kind of taking over at that point. And, you know, we used uh, compilers like Turbo C, which is a, obviously a C, C++ compiler. But I remember at the time I had my Amiga 500 at home and I had this really, uh, I don't know if you guys remember it, but there was a 
PC emulator that came out really early on in the Amiga's life called Transformer, and yeah. it was a disc-based emulator, and it didn't uh, emulate any type of graphics mode. The, the only thing it did was text mode. So if you were running like a, a, a DOS file manager or a, a, um, a notepad or some kind of DOS editor, it would work fine. But if you, as soon as you tried to run a game on it, it obviously wouldn't work. And this thing was really slow. Obviously, it ran on a stock Amiga 500. And I remember um, I tried to run Turbo C at home on my Amiga and I actually got it to work. So it was really cool because I was at going, going to college writing uh, C programs in Turbo C and then when I had homework, I would go home, load up my Amiga, and run it at home on my Amiga. And I was just fascinated by the, you know, the emulation um, capabilities that the Amiga had. But uh, you know, that that C and and C plus plus were the languages that that we used. And towards the end of college, um, we had kind of moved on to Java and some of those things. That Java was really starting to take some traction, get some traction in the industry. But um, I ended up doing mostly C and C plus plus programs. I think, you know, people often forget, you know, how convenient we've got things these days because I had friends at school who had Amigas and they had like Atari STs and the fact that you couldn't actually run the same stuff at home that you did at school or at work and even like stuff like word processing documents and stuff, you couldn't read like doc files on like your Amiga at home and... A rich text. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it was really just an amazing machine and it is it still is an amazing amazing machine as we know, but, you know, it... There was always something, if you had a problem, you know, the Amiga could solve it one way or the other. And that was what I really liked about the system. It was just so open and so versatile, um, so many different possibilities and so many ways to get the job done. And I, I, like I said, you know, I remember I was using my Amiga 500 all throughout school and, you know, some of my friends were buying kind of high end at the time, 386 and, and, and 486 computers and uh, here I am, you know, with a real slow Amiga, but I'm I'm still doing the same same homework that everyone else is, and that was really really awesome. Well, were you much of an arcade goer as well? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, growing up with uh, a computer in the household really meant that I'd like to uh, read, you know, the, the magazines that were going on, you know. So I, I would read Zap sixty four and computer and video games, and um, later on Amiga format and some of those very popular British magazines but there was always especially in zap 64 and uh, computer and video games there was always a section on arcades you know um what's coming out in the arcades or what's what's new in japan right now that that's that's coming to uh to our shores here and uh when i saw the screenshots of some of these arcade games i was like wow this is absolutely amazing so yeah we would uh we would go every sunday um family when i was younger we would go bowling and um there was always you know, 20 choice arcade cabinets there. So after we, we had finished our games of bowling, we would, uh, um, my brother and I would, would hit the arcades and, and play all the, all the, the, the fun games. So absolutely loved the arcades when I was a kid. And, um, as a, I guess as a, a throwback to that, um, I, uh, now own, um, a couple of arcade cabinets in my house. So oh, nice. I, I do have a lot of influence with arcade machines and the arcades. Absolutely. So I remember, you know, sticks in my mind as a kid, the first time I saw Ridge Racer in an arcade blew my mind. It was in one of the sit-down actual, you know, cars as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Ridge Racer for me was was definitely one of those games too. Uh, obviously, Do Daytona USA was, was another one. Yeah. Just, the, just the 60 frames smooth scrolling and the, the link up where you could just, you know, race your buddy next to you, it was absolutely mind-blowing. And uh, even even later on, you know, things like um, Sega Rally 2 and some of those advanced um, Sega, um, you know, 3D games were, were, were phenomenal. And then the, you know, the light gun games like House of the Dead, um, awesome, awesome games to play in the arcades. When you mentioned Sega there, I mean, that they were such an innovative company in the arcade as well. I mean, people often talk about their home consoles, but, you know, that they had some amazing and to this day, they still do as well, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm a big I'm a big Sega fan. Always have been. I know they, especially lately, you know, they've they've kind of lost their way a little bit. But uh, hopefully, you know, uh, Sonic Mania and um, and uh, Sonic Forces, which I know people don't like uh, uh, very much. I, I don't think it's that bad. Mm. Um, you know, hopefully there's a, a resurgence or, a, a, you know, a resurgence of, of Sega um, in the arcades and, and in, in the home as well. I think that would be great to see. Well, why did you decide to start doing a YouTube channel then and sending your videos out there? 
because I'm crazy. No, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the the best way to answer that is um, I like programming. And when I um, – so I had an Amiga computer in the 90s and then I kind of forgot about it for, for many, many years and got really stuck into the PC and, and consoles and, and things like that. And around 2010, I – had this itch to buy an Amiga 1200 and that was one Amiga that I never had. In fact, I never had an Amiga that had an AGA chipset before. And, uh, I thought, you know what? I, I feel like buying an Amiga again. I want to get a 1200. So I ended up getting a 1200 and I was very, very lucky, uh, to find a blizzard 1260 060 accelerator. Very, very lucky for cheap. Uh, I got it locally. Uh, basically, the guy was selling it. He didn't want it anymore. He needed the money quickly. So I, I got a really good deal. So all of a sudden, I've got this souped up Amiga 1200 with you know the fastest accelerator you can get at the time. And I thought, you know what? I, I really want to um, see if I can port some software to this thing. Uh, at the time, there was uh, another uh, individual by the name of Novacoder who was releasing things like Quake and, and Doom and um, a couple of other ports. And I thought, you know, I can do this. I, I have experience doing this and um, I think I can make this work. So long story short, I ended up, uh, my YouTube channel really was started out being a result of me porting things to the Amiga and just making some little videos about the ports I was working on because I felt like the best way to promote what I'm doing is just to make a little five minute video and post it up on the EAB forums and, and to show everyone what's going on. So I did that kind of to start out. And initially it was just a, um, you know, me with an iPhone, um, very, very shaky camera, you know, no editing, really bad. And I think slowly over time, it really morphed into something else. And I, I can't tell you the reason why um, it, it turned into a, a, a tech channel. I just kind of felt like, you know, I've got this um, storage closet full of um different computers and hardware and uh, i just kind of felt like you know i feel like i want to just start documenting this stuff and, and really showing people what i have and also showing people what's out there and it's kind of transformed now into um more into the preservation side where i really want to preserve um some of the you know the history of this hardware that i have um, cause eventually, you know, we're, we're not going to be around and, and, um, our hardware is going to be gone in some way or hopefully not for a long time, but I really want to preserve, you know, the hardware and, and uh, that's, I think that's really the main reason why my channel, you know, is what it is today. I mean, the systems you cover in your channel is very varied. Have you kind of acquired these systems because of your channel or did you already, already have like quite a big collection? Uh, yeah, most of them I already actually own. Um, some of them I will say I did buy specifically for the channel, but I would say the majority of systems that I've already shown on my channel um, are things that I've, I've acquired over the years. Well, you mentioned, you know, the Acorn Archimedes we were talking about before. You've, you've done a video on that, the a, A3010, which I've got one in my, my collection that <laughs> I still haven't really got up and running properly yet. But uh, even like, you know, getting systems like that in America, how, how do you kind of acquire these systems? And do you kind of look overseas to see what's been happening in other countries as well? Well, uh, I'm fortunate enough to, um, as mentioned, you know, obviously uh, I grew up in Australia and, and the BBC was was a machine that was um, in the schools and 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 had some popularity. I wouldn't say it was a hugely popular um, computer in, in Australia, but it certainly was around. And again, I, I did see it in the stores. So long story short, I, I have um, family that still live down there. And I remember about three months before I um, did the video on the uh, the Archimedes, I was definitely looking around for one. Uh, it was it was a machine that, that sat next to the Atari ST and the Amiga as kind of like the, the third machine. And in many ways, it was the most powerful one. Um, a lot of the Amiga fans probably don't agree with that, but um, a, a, as far as raw performance goes, you know, um, the ARM processor is and the RISC, uh, RISC architecture is, is very powerful. So I was fascinated by this machine. And, and long story short, I tapped my brother over the shoulder and, and said, look, hey, if you, see, uh, if you see one going for sale in, in Australia or anywhere, just keep an eye out for one and, you know, I'll... I'll obviously pay for the shipping and the, and the cost of it to get it over here. But um, that's how I ended up picking one up. I, that, that was definitely a machine that was not part of my initial collection, but that that was something I was very interested in in picking up. We're well, talking about, you know, preserving history and documenting it. I mean, the Econ Archimedes, the legacy that that machine 
has left, you know, the ARM processors in like every mobile phone, all the portable consoles and everything these days as well. Recently. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's it's uh, that particular machine is very fascinating, and and I would say that the uh, the Archimedes video is my probably the favorite video that I've done. I, I really had a lot of fun putting that machine together, just from the research perspective and opening up the machine and just playing games on it and just the whole thing. It, it really was, was the, the best video that I've done now, as far as, um, the best, the, you know, the most number of views, well, it wasn't, but, um, that doesn't necessarily mean I didn't like it the most. I, I thought that was, um, really my favorite video and I, I absolutely love the machine. It's a very fascinating and interesting, uh, architecture. And like you said, it's, it's still being used, uh, today. And well, I mean, it's basically taken over the world. I mean, there's mm. so many um, devices on, in so many different um, pieces of hardware and software out there. So it's just amazing. Well, uh, another lot of videos that I love that you do, uh, the restoration videos. And I think these are really good because everybody has their own method of restor restoring stuff and everyone has their own kind of technique. So, you know, you can look at this and you could compare it with other ones and then kind of, you know, make your own mind up and see which way is the best way to restore <laughs> something. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I like doing the restoration videos. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I really want to, um, and hopefully it comes across in my restoration videos, is I'm just kind of an average guy. You know, I, I'm not a, a tech wizard or, um, you know, I don't have super expensive um, desoldering stations and, um, you know, super expensive hot air guns and, and, and rework stations and things like that. Um, so really what I'm trying to kind of get across in those videos is, you know, if I can do this, then you can too. And all, and all you need to do are these things to make it work. And, and in some cases I show the failures that I've had. Um, I did one on the Apple two GS where I retro brighted the case and I was convinced this thing was going to turn out, you know, pristine and look just as new, as good as new. But what ended up happening was I, I, I absolutely destroyed the case because I um, didn't do the retro brighting properly. And so, you know, so sometimes my videos are, are about, you know, here's not what to do. You know, here's a cautionary tale. Um, don't don't be like me and don't screw up your, your hardware. Uh, I'll, I'll take the hit for you guys. You know what I mean? So I, 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 I like to kind of keep everything, uh, all the different experiences that I've had in a restoration, the good ones and the bad ones. So hopefully people can can take that away. And, and if there are th if they are thinking about doing their own restorations, um, you know, they can really take take some advice or, or take notice of the, what I've done. One of my favorite videos on your channel is when you um, connected an Amiga using a Raspberry Pi to the internet. Um, yes. I mean, do you kind of get a kick out of like pushing old machines beyond their original limits? <laughs> I do. I do. I I have this fascination about getting all my machines online in some capacity. <laughs> and uh, I actually have um, a Sharp 68000, X68000, which I, I want to desperately get online. Now, I know you can do it. There's 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 com software, and it's probably pretty simple just to plug in a Wi-Fi 232 modem or something like that to get it working. But um, I, I love just, you know, I get this kick out of um, eight and sixteen bit stuff um, getting connected to the internet uh, that really have no business being on there. Yeah, because I've got a Commodore sixteen and a plus four, and I've got my sixty four online with one of the um, NIC cards. But it's I don't think there's actually some guy made like some like homemade terminal software for the Commodore <laughs> plus four. But there's not actually anything in place. I right. mean, the guys on forums saying, look, you know, if someone makes an interface, we can make some software. But some systems are more tricky than others, aren't they? To get connected. absolutely, yeah, uh, you know, especially the the old the older Commodore stuff. Um, Obviously, you know the user port is non-standard. Now, there's, there's, like I said, that there are the, there is the kind of C64 modem and the, the Wi-Fi devices and things like that. But some of these um, older obscure machines that don't have just a standard RS232 port uh, makes it a little trickier to, to get online. But I think uh, every computer, you know, as far back as I can remember, has some type of serial output interface, whether it's RS232 or some kind of uh, you know, uh, custom standard that 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 has been put together. Um, there's still a way to interface into and out of the machine. So I think if that's available, then 
um, there's going to be some smart guy out there that that puts together some hardware to make it work. And you can't be tweeting on a Commodore PET. Cool. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, I, I saw one. I think some some guys been tweeting from a VIC-20, and uh, yeah. I think that's pretty cool to see that the VIC-20 uh, being used as a internet machine as well. I think that's awesome. Well, how do you kind of find these ideas of old technology because i was looking at your video and you had the cross play between an amiga and an atari st and i totally forgot that that could work you know <laughs> yeah i it's a gravy that's a great question I, I don't really know sometimes i just sit there and think about ideas you know um i i will say that the um the cross uh, null modem link between the two different machines was actually an idea that i saw um on twitter um where there was a gentleman by the name of, and hopefully I get his name right, I think his name is Paul Fletcher, and he does battle chess tournaments uh, in the US, and he basically linked up seven, um, well, not, not at the same time, but it was a competition between seven different computers all running battle chess connected via RS-232. And I was fascinated by this. So he had a Apple II GS and an Apple II and a, an Amiga and an ST uh, and a couple of other machines as well. And uh, I was like, well, is, is there even a way to, you know, connect these machines up and play play games on them? So, you know, I did some did some digging on it, and as it turns out, there's at least, um, you know, five, six, seven titles that you can connect between an Amiga and an ST and play online or via a null modem link. Um, and what I ended up doing was uh, I even reached out to uh, Sean Southern. Um, you guys know who that is. He's yeah. the the guy that that, that developed the Lotus games. And uh, he was very helpful and, and told me, you know, why why they decided to do it and, um, and 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 they thought it was a cool idea and they didn't think it was too difficult to do because um, both the ST and the Amiga run a 68000 and uh, he said it was pretty trivial to add and I uh, thought thought that was really really fascinating stuff that 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 programmers had a thought even a thought in their mind to to link up the two machines. Well, in your video where you did show an Amiga 500 and the Atari ST playing battle chess against each other you didn't yep. actually show the result though so who actually won that <laughs> the, the st ended up winning it, it's, it's a little tricky to, to 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 see it but um the st kind of pops up the the dialogue first uh, on the right hand side oh. so um <laughs> yeah the st ended up winning and um from what I've been told, and looking at, at Paul Fletcher's uh, um, um, results uh, of his tournaments, the ST seems to win a lot of the times, and the, the poor old Amiga never really wins uh, at all. So I'm not really sure what's going on there. Maybe there's a little bit difference in the code or something, but uh, uh, the ST has uh, a really good track record as far as winning battle chess games and tournaments. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit more optimized for that actual system that could explain it i guess but that's, that's i guess i mean cool. I, I think if it, if we're talking about um cpu performance um you know the, the st is slightly ahead of the amiga mm. um as far as clock speed and, and and maybe that has something to do with it maybe it, it can crunch more uh, uh calculations you know before it has to um come back so but again i don't really know maybe it's just luck of the draw you know so <laughs> Uh, it's it's very interesting though. You may have just predicted the future of esports there, where there's no human <laughs> players involved at all. And <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, but let's... you know, I think it's really cool to to um, just to kind of touch on a little, little more, especially in this day and age where you know everything's behind a paywall and and uh, an Xbox can't talk to a, a Sony PlayStation and you know and uh, and I really wanted to illustrate that back in those days there there were no boundaries. You know, if you wanted to link up a machine. To um, to talk to another machine and play a game together, um, you know the programmers just added it in. There was there was no um, issues with legalities or uh, you know um, networks uh, network frameworks and things like that that people have to worry about these days. Well, speaking of breaking the boundaries, I mean some of your most popular videos recently I've seen have been about the uh, the vampire accelerator, which um, mm -hmm. you know actually pushes this old hardware into completely new dimensions. I mean, can you explain a bit about what the vampire is for our audience that might not be too familiar with it? Yeah, I mean, it, the vampire is essentially a, an accelerator for the Amiga that um, bolts onto your uh, existing processor and essentially takes it over, and it it, it really. Um, accelerates the Amiga to speeds that were just unheard of in the past. And it gives 060 performance, but it also gives you um, a lot faster performance because there's 
the uh, what they call the uh, AMMX instruction set, where if you take advantage of that, can really um, increase performance a lot faster than that as well. So it's it's just the the absolute fastest Amiga uh, accelerator board that you could ever possibly use. Well, I've noticed another thing that you cover is a uh, jammer, which is very interesting. I love the old arcade cabs and kind of being able to connect these new machines to the arcade cab. So you've got one where you've connected a Xbox 360 inside a Sega Blast City candy cab. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, jammer is a really, um, you know, and again, you know, my video is really about uh, how simple it is for people to to pick th pick up this hobby and, and get into it you know you hear the word jammer and you hear the word arcade boards and you hear the word arcade cabinet and immediately it, it sounds a little daunting or overwhelming to some people and, and i remember when i first got into the arcade hobby uh, i had no idea what i was doing as well but essentially jammer is a standard where it has different things on on the different pins and you can essentially tap a red green blue signal and audio, um, audio signals and joystick movements and joystick button press signals on that jammer board. So once you really understand how a jammer board works or how jammer works, then it's really easy to convert or to think about um, consoles uh, to output to that jammer standard. So essentially what you're doing is, is you're taking the RGB signals out of your Xbox or out of your console and you're taking the button press movements from your joysticks and you're wiring it up to a jammer board, which you can then connect to, you know, an arcade cabinet or um, a super gun if you have one of those and essentially just play um, your consoles on, on, a, an, on an arcade machine, which is really, really awesome to do. It's a lot of fun. I saw you've been doing some um, ports of software that didn't previously exist on the platform to the Vampire. Uh, recently, I mean, what was kind of the process of doing that, and what software have you managed to get running on there? Well, I didn't. I will say this: I, I didn't port things specifically for the Vampire. It's just that the, because the Vampire is the fastest uh, accelerator you can get, it, it's really just a. Um, I guess it's it's. I would say it's Vampire um, preferred rather than you know Vampire specific. Um, like I said, I, I do have an 060 accelerator in my 1200. And um, that runs super, super, super quick as well. So, um, you know, a lot of the times it's kind of a neck and neck race where things run just about at the same um, frame rates. But going back to your question, I mean, the ports that I've worked on is I, I ported Rise of the Triad to the Amiga and I also ported Strife, which is a really awesome role playing game that uses the the original Doom engine that a lot of people don't really know about. Uh, when, when we talk about the Doom engine, um, the, the, the more pop popular games are um, Doom, obviously, Doom 2 and Heretic and Hexen. But uh, there was kind of the, the fifth game, which was Strife. And, and that, that's a really fun game. So it, I ported that one. And um, I, re more recently, there was a port of Cannonball, which is the OutRun engine. So you can actually play OutRun on your Amiga with a Vampire card. And that's definitely um, a release that was targeted for the Vampire uh, if you have a fast 060, it'll it'll run pretty well. But the Vampire, you know, kind of is, is definitely the preferred device there. And um, you know, I, one of the things that I, I do like about the Amiga is um, it, it's very easy to port software to it, uh, especially uh, with the compilers that we have today. Um, it's not as I, I guess it's not as tricky or, or, or hard to. Uh, um, to, to get things to work these days. It, it's really a case of um, using the, the right compilers to get the job done. And with a lot of things that are open source these days, um, it really means that you'll see, and not just myself, but I'm sure there's um, other people out there that are, are porting things to the Amiga with the Vampire card, especially now that more people uh, are starting to embrace it and, and, and purchase and get a hold of the hardware. I mean, you did mention two of my favourite old school FPS games there, Heretic and Hexen. You know, I've loved those games since they first came out. I mean, were you a fan of those like original old school FPS games? And were there any others that you liked that you still enjoy today? Absolutely, uh, I loved I loved Heretic and Hexen as well. And uh, 
you know, when I got my PC after after the Amiga, that, that were the games that I kind of gravitated towards, those early 486 um, first-person shooter games. I also liked uh, Quake when that came out, the original Quake. I wasn't a huge fan of Quake 2. Um, I thought it was a little over the top. I loved the original Quake. I thought that was just an amazing game, and I still, I still play it a lot today. But, um, you know, other things I, I was a big fan of, uh, the LucasArts games like Full Throttle and uh, Loom and some of those CD-based games that came out. And, you know, things like that, Wing Commander, um, uh, Privateer, just, just those early DOS games were, were just amazing. Crusader, I don't know if you remember that one by Origin mm, Systems, yeah. uh, Crusader No Remorse, that's a, like an isometric, um, isometric game, which was just fascinating. It's just a great game to play. Um, yeah, I, I could I could talk about this for the next uh, twenty minutes. <laughs> so it's uh, so many so many good games and so many memories. Well, uh, one thing that I love to see is uh, Ken Silverman's build engine being used um, for you know Duke Nukem 3D. And I was wondering about porting other titles because I, I noticed there's a video of Shadow Warrior out there. Yeah, I, I I actually have been working on a port of Shadow Warrior, and um, it's just. Uh, a couple of reasons why it's not out yet. It's number one, it's very, very buggy and yeah. it, it needs a lot of work and a lot of polish. And number two, it's just um, finding the time. It's sometimes it's very hard to sit down and, and spend uh, five or six hours, you know, getting things, uh, you know, to, to get some quality uh, development time in. But um, there's also uh, Redneck Rampage, which yes, is another one that's, that's, that's out that. there and yeah. that that's open source as well. So, um, you know, you guys are thinking thinking the same way I am. I, I definitely would love to see ports of, of those games to the Amiga. Um, and I think it's definitely doable. Uh, it's just it requires some time. Well, um, one of your most recent kind of popular videos, well, a couple of them have been modding on the kind of Xbox and doing the soft modding. And to me, this is like a, a dark art that we never knew about. <laughs> so it's great to see it on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the soft modding stuff... Um, it goes back to the um, preserving history a little bit. You know, um, that's not to say that there isn't uh, a ton of soft modding guides out there. Um, but really what I'm trying to show is just how easy this thing is to do. You know, if you have a copy of um, Splinter Cell or uh, Mech Warrior, um, you can you can do this thing pretty easily and you can, you know, open the door for uh, emulators and uh, media players and, and all sorts of different things. It's, it's very um, strange, isn't it? Because you used to get games that would kind of have a glitch on them or there'd be a glitch <laughs> on a memory card that some yeah. programmer messed up and then you can get all this access to it. It's insane. Absolutely. I mean, I always wonder how people work this out, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I understand how soft mods work. Um, essentially, you're, you're just kind of glitching the memory, like you said, in order to execute um, a piece of unsigned code which is typically um, a bootloader, a, a Linux bootloader or something. But what I never really understand is how people figure this out, that, that Splinter Cell and MechWarrior are the games that have, you know, um, save games that, that will potentially glitch, the, uh, glitch the, the memory. Well, you do often, you know, do restoration videos on classic systems as well. I mean, have you kind of got any tips for people on keeping their old machines in good condition and keep them running? I think in general, clean them, um, power them on every so often. Don't don't just leave a, a system in your in your closet um, for five years. You know, take them out and power them on at least every six months. If you can't do six months, at least once a year. Um, plug them in and, and test them out. Um, that's definitely one. Um, open the machine up, um, clean all the dust out. Uh, you know, I, I do recognise that some people don't um, have. Or don't want to open their machines up. Um, maybe they're collectors and, and they don't want to, you know, um, mess up any um, stickers or anything like that or any labels. But if you are, um, you know, a, a little more tech savvy, you know, f open them up, clean them out, and I would also say just um, put them in a dark closet. You know, make sure that they don't uh, start turning yellow. And and if they do, if they do t turn yellow, um, you know, definitely think about retro brighting. I, I think it's it's a good it's a good way to kind of keep things looking good over over time, um, but if you are going to retro bright, uh, do some tests first on on some small things. Um, get a feel for how it works. Um, you, you certainly don't want to retro bright, um, let's say an Amiga five hundred as your first uh, project uh, because you may end up you know doing more damage than than what it's worth. So uh, I, I would say just you know just just. Do a little uh, sample on on a small piece of plastic. Um, a, a good test for me is um, 
like a uh, a Super Nintendo or something like that. that that's mm-hmm. something that you can easily just um, soak in 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 hydrogen peroxide. Uh, you don't you just give it a bath. You just kind of leave it leave it laying in there for a couple of hours and or, or a mouse or something, I guess. Yeah, or or a mouse or, yeah. or an Amiga mouse or something like that. It's it's something smaller is definitely uh, a, a good first uh, approach to retro writing. Well, if there's any listeners listening, in the UK, we have Bee Blonde, which is the uh, ladies' <laughs> hair product that I use. And that seems to go okay. It was 12%. Yeah. It wasn't 20 And And you look fabulous. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Bee Blonde, uh, I've seen... Uh, other people's videos on, on that, and uh, I think that's that's definitely something that that seems to work really well. Well, have you always been into like retro systems, or did you take a break and then you know kind of rebuy your collection and get back into them? That's a good question. I mean, I, I think I've always had retro systems around um, at any given time. There was probably a point in my life in the early two thousands where I didn't have as many systems. Um, I've always had an Amiga computer. You know, uh, I. I have the same Amiga 500 that I've always had um, when I grew up and I have the same C64 that I've always had. So I do like to keep um, my my systems. But uh, I've also, you know, had moments uh, over the years where I've just had a PC and, and um, maybe a closet with an Amiga and a C64 in it. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, now, though, um, I really like to keep as many systems as I can. I'm not. I wouldn't say that I'm hoarding the systems, but I like to uh, to have as many as I can. I, I think owning original hardware is, is 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 something that's very important to me, and I want to continue to do that. And I will say that I've had some regrets over the years of selling things that, uh, when you look at the prices now, you just kind of cringe a little bit, and, and you're like, oh my god, why did I why did I sell that CD32, you know, four years ago? Because they're worth like $400 now. So, you know, I, th- there's definitely been some regret there with, with some things that I've sold over the years. Oh, I mean, I, I've got some bigger regrets in some ways. I've actually thrown <laughs> systems out, you know, over the years. Oh, yeah. I, I think I've thrown two Amiga 1200s out, I'll two throw, Amiga 500s. Throw out, I've okay. thrown out a Mega Drive, Super Nintendo. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't think I've ever thrown any systems out, but... Um, you know, I, I have parted with some systems, and at the end of the day, really, um, it, it's it, it does it does hurt a little bit, you know. But uh, but you know, I'm also always hopeful that eventually something is going to come up, and I'll be uh, reunited with with uh, with the hardware that I used to enjoy and love. You know, I think I, I had, had. A, a period of uh, in the '90s when my dad was like, "Let's just chuck out all this old crap," and <laughs> basically <laughs> cleared the house, and it was like a massacre. <laughs> well, people didn't value it, think it was going to be. Well, it's like you look now; CRT monitors are starting to get rare now. Yeah, yeah, we threw about yeah. six of them away, yeah. like huge ones as well. You know. Mm. Yeah, I, I um, uh, on my channel, you've probably seen it, but I have a Commodore 1702 that I do a lot of my videos with. Uh, yeah. It's just a great monitor because um, it has. It only takes a composite uh, signal. It has a S video signal as well in the back, but um, it just has the clearest uh, picture quality of any composite signal I've ever seen. And uh, I just throw anything at this thing, and it just looks good and it works. And um, one thing someone told me was, "Oh, you've got the you've got the the flap on it, you know, where where it's where you you, you know you lift it down. It's got all the the knobs for the different uh, the volume and the horizontal uh, size and everything." He's like. Um, the flap is worth so much money, you know, that you've got one with a flap on it. I'm like, what? I mean, you know, aren't these things like uh, things that you can buy for ten dollars at, uh, at 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 a garage sale or something? And you know, no, I mean, CRTs, uh, the price of those things are outrageous these days. Uh, they're just so sought after, and um, people um, pay absolutely through the roof for them. Uh, it's amazing. Well, they don't ship them either because it's you know, I, I did see an awful picture the other day on Facebook of someone who actually got uh, like a 1080 4 monitor or something shipped and it just smashed to bits because uh, I, I saw the same oh. I saw that same Facebook post and uh, I think my my heart just sank a little bit you know it was it was it was pretty sad to see those things happen well what are your future plans for the channel you know I don't necessarily know the answer to that I think I'm just going to continue doing what I what I what I'm doing with with different things um, I do have a few uh, videos that are coming up and one of them I will uh, say is I, I'm doing a, another Amiga 500 accelerator uh, I did recently do one on the terrible fire card that had come out by uh, Stephen Leary which was a, a fantastic accelerator for an Amiga 500 
And, um, you know, if, if something like that was out back in the day for $130, uh, I would have just bought like four of them because the price is, is so so good, but there is uh, another Amiga 500 accelerator that um, actually I'm I'm being delivered tomorrow, which I'm going to do a uh, a video on. Um, I think a lot of people are interested in that, um, and there's more console stuff coming up. Uh, I I do uh, have more development kits with from different systems that uh, I'm going to explore as well. So really, it's going to be more of the same next year. Um, you know, things that I think are interesting that 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 my fans or my viewers like, um, I'll continue to do. But um, there's really no uh, long-term uh, strategy or plan for the channel. It's really just to continue. You know, um, 2018 the way that um, I'm wrapping up this year. I loved your recent video on the uh, the PSX as well. I mean, you know, seeing the more obscure systems and learning a bit more about them is always really interesting too. Absolutely. I mean, I love Japanese computers and consoles, um, you know, and a lot of people didn't even know about this machine. Um, if I go through the comments that, that there was even a machine like this and a lot of people had heard about it. Um, they saw it in a magazine or something, but, uh, they quickly forgot about it because it was such a, a failure in Japan. It was only a really around for about 12 months before they discontinued it. And, um, you know, in, in some ways that the, the Sony PSX is the original um, Xbox One and PS4 because it's got the the DVR capability where you can record, um, you know, you can record and 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 play at the same time and um, and do all those things that you can take for granted in modern consoles these days. So in, in, it was very innovative in, in so many ways, and it had the original, you know, cross media bar um, dashboard that the PS3 and the and the PS the PSP had. So it's, it's definitely a, an interesting machine to, 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 to go into and investigate and get involved with. One thing I will say is some people, um, ask me why, why didn't you tear down the machine? And the reason is, uh, there is so many moving parts in that thing, um, that I didn't feel comfortable opening it up without a tear down guide. And there isn't actually a tear down guide that I could find online. Um, there's literally about, 200 screws and um three you know three or four different metal brackets and uh there's about 30 ribbon cables in there and if you pull out the wrong piece before um uh, another one you're going to basically break a ribbon cable and you've <laughs> pretty much just bricked your machine so i really wanted to make sure that i knew what i was doing so i didn't really feel like i i wanted to tear the machine down yeah you, you don't want to be the guy that writes the tear down guide <laughs> no, definitely not so but if there is someone that that knows of a tear down guide um uh, let us know i'd be very interested because i would love to tear one of those machines down and i think um doing laser repairs on the uh, DVD laser is, is definitely something that I would like to do. Um, and they're pretty easy to do on a standard PlayStation or a PlayStation 2 machine, but uh, the PSX is a completely different animal. There's, there's definitely a lot more involved in getting that machine open. Well, Dimitri, now we're both massive fans of your channel. Um, and what can we said, keep up the good work in 2018. And um, if people are listening to this and they, they want to check out your videos, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on YouTube. Just search for Modern Vintage Gamer. Um, I'll come up there and on Twitter, at Modern Vintage G and Facebook, Modern Vintage Gamer. It's pretty easy to find me. Fantastic. Well, really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you for coming on. Thank you very much, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure.